good afternoon friends and all the colleagues from the indian ict industry a very very warm welcome on behalf of cyber media and data quest to the 27th data quest annual awards to felicitate the leaders of the indian ict earlier we used to say it but now the indian ict industry i hope all of us we used to have the housekeeping rules earlier but i think that is changed now in the context of uh, everybody working from home and all these activities and events and presentations happening from home so i hope all of us have got the right and enough bandwidth to continue to participate in this and we have adequate light on our faces and uh, we are sitting in a quite reasonably quiet place thank you so much once again and welcome to the data quest awards uh, function <clears throat> as you know we have uh, in this uh, three main awards the it person of the year award the path breaker award and the uh, lifetime achievement award uh, but because we are doing this uh, digitally this time online this time so we have decided to split it and you know uh, <clears throat> attention span is uh, shorter on online so we have decided to split it into three parts so we are having the lifetime achievement award function uh, this uh, afternoon and subsequently we have uh, we will have the it person of the year and the path breaker of the year awards also <clears throat> the data quest awards are very well known in the industry i don't need to uh, tell Uh, the people here about it but just very quickly they have been there since 1993 i think if i remember correctly so that's almost 27 years now uh, traditionally we have organized these in delhi but once in a while we have done this awards function in it used to be a gala uh, awards dinner and uh, celebrations we have done this in bombay and bangalore also Uh, in uh, in 2014 i think we had uh, i think it was 2014 we had uh, uh, prime minister narendra modi as the chief guest for the awards function where he sort of uh, proposed the famous theory that uh, earlier civilizations used to settle next to uh, rivers but uh, in this era and going forward civilizations will come up in places where are the where there are digital highways so this uh, awards uh, uh, is uh, basically for uh, recognizing and felicitating and honoring uh, the lifetime uh, contribution like and uh, what we uh, normally do is that we have a jury of very very eminent people who uh, get together and before that we seek uh, nominations from the industry from our readers for the various categories of awards we seek nominations and all those nominations are then uh, filtered and uh, <clears throat> and put together uh, by the ed editorial team of uh, cyber media and data quest and then those names are presented before the uh, jury and the jury then Uh, deliberates and discusses and debates on those names and the uh, award winners are winners are uh, selected the uh, lifetime contribution lifetime uh, as you can uh, very well figure out from the name is basically to recognize and honor the person who has really made a big impact on the indian it industry uh, indian it industry which is now a global uh, uh, a global brand Uh, recognized world over one of the most uh, um, significant contributions uh, to the world uh, from india so uh, this award is primarily for somebody who has really spent his lifetime in building uh, the industry and uh, <clears throat> if i can tell you who were the jury members uh, this time so we had uh, a very very distinguished uh, jury Uh, like uh, every year and uh, we had uh, uh, this time we had uh, uh, mr arjun malhotra 
who was the life last year's uh, uh, <coughs> lifetime contribution winner he was the chairman of the jury besides him we had uh, ritesh agarwal founder of uh, poyo rooms also as a jury member and <coughs> then we had uh, mr ajay prakash sani secretary of meti mr cp gurnani uh, ceo of tech mahindra also present here he was also a jury member we had devdeep sen gupta who was at that time the uh, md of sap india and dr gulshan rai who was then the national security um, it security chief of the country and uh, karan bajwa was there he was at that time heading ibm in india uh, mr so som satsangi was there uh, md of uh, hp enterprises in india and uh, besides uh, mr pradeep gupta chairman of cyber media and thomas george the managing editor of uh, of cyber media <clears throat> so these were the the uh, jury members and uh, <clears throat> um, past winners have we have also the list of the past winners of the it lifetime contribution award is also very very uh, very very impressive Uh, some of these people uh, went on to uh, to be awarded the padma awards and many of them are now actually leading giant it congl global uh, it conglomerates so some of the names if i can uh, share with you um, mr fc kohli one of the uh, founders of tcs dr n sheshagri of doe and uh, the department of it professor rajaraman Uh, major general bala subramaniam uh, mr sam petroda uh, mr dr vijay bhatkar mr n vittal um, then we had some of the other names in this uh, was uh, mr shorab shivastav uh, mr nandan nilekani uh, mr vineet nair mr ashok suta and obviously mr arjun malhotra himself so these have been some of the illustrious winners of the uh, it person of the Uh, under the lifetime contribution uh, award <clears throat> um, now that we are presenting this awards and we have got some uh, very very uh, senior people the stalwarts from the industry uh, who have assembled here with us so we thought we will not let this opportunity go and therefore we have also kept a panel discussion to talk about the 40 years these were the people who have actually been instrumental in building the it industry and uh, we thought we will not uh, let this opportunity go without uh, picking up the brains of such illustrious uh, builders of indian it so we have a panel discussion which will be moderated by <coughs> uh, uh, bg and uh, the panelists this uh, afternoon are mr rajender pawar uh, the founder of niit and also the founder of Uh, of uh, the education it somebody who built the it education sector uh, in the country uh, the other panelists that we have are <coughs> mr arjun malhotra one of the founders of uh, hcl uh, again hcl as you all know was one of the pioneers of uh, it Uh, sector in india and uh, <clears throat> mr malhotra besides being uh, uh, one of the founders was also a very very passionate promoter of entrepreneurship and he brought in that entire culture of entrepreneurship in uh, the company and uh, as some of you might know he is himself now after all that he did he is now an entrepreneur himself and uh, we also have with us uh, mr c p gurnani Uh, again a veteran uh, doesn't need any introduction like the other two panelists uh, who's really been instrumental in uh, giving the uh, the name and the prestige to the indian software industry he is now heading a very very large uh, indian it services company uh, which is now uh, the the reason for the success behind a lot of other multinational companies the world over including british telecom so we have very very illustrious speakers today and uh, we're going to talk about how the last 40 years have been in the indian it industry and what do the next 
uh, uh, 10 years look like in uh, between we will also have some messages from uh, uh, our friends in the industry including messages from mr chandrashekhar mr chandrashekhar and chandrashekhar who is the chairman of of uh, the tata group now uh, messages uh, ibrahim uh, ibrahim yeah. can we can we speed up please and can we okay. uh, come so, to so the video so i videos? think the messages will be there so i will now hand over to uh, pg to uh, talk to uh, these uh, is uh, founding fathers of indian it and uh, uh, i hope it will be a very very interesting discussion pg over to you so thank you very much uh, ibrahim uh, can we uh, play the jury video please Yeah, I think we are very uh, at a very a nice point. I mean, we've got new technologies, we've got AI, we've got machine learning, we've got cloud. A lot of that is going to come in and disrupt the whole industry the way it is. So I just see a phenomenal amount of growth, phenomenal amount of change that's going to come into the IT industry, not just 2020 but uh, beyond that. Too. So I I'm very upbeat about it. So. it was very interesting i think we have uh, it gets getting more and more difficult to try and identify winners in each of the segments i think we had a very interesting discussion between you know, all the jury members uh, the good news is that we were somewhere you know there was a major consensus on most of this but it was very close and uh, you know uh, there are a number of great top people great companies that are doing amazing things in india and i am you know i feel sorry for the next jury they're going to have a much more difficult time than we had in trying to get select winners so what is your outlook for indian it industry for so digital technologies over the next decade is going to create an economic value of 1 trillion dollar in india 2020 is a step towards a direction now today we are truly a digital nation the digital technology embracing across all sphere of industries and all activities of life actually the jury was pretty well distinguished and it had a mixture of young entrepreneurship as well as experienced business leaders and it was pretty enriching personally for me and for the overall interaction i think we had a very very productive day and a productive session as you know we are in the era of digital transformation so most industries are now trying to digitize some part of their entire ecosystem when you are doing digital transformation technology is at the core of all of this transformation so you are really looking at adopting technologies like blockchain iot ai ml and what's really happening is as these companies are trying to go and adopt these technologies these technologies are now getting easily available on the major hyper uh, scalar cloud platforms which means that most of the innovation and the creation of new platforms and new models and new innovative chargeback mechanism is all happening very very fast so when you really look at the proliferation of all of these technologies in the industry which is which is giving rise to new industries new business models i i would want to say that the outlook is very very positive i think the overall experience was well, yeah, very good you know what happens typically when you have so many different people from different uh, uh, business segments come and talk there are insights that you tend to take with you which you never had for example uh, we got a great insight on how swiggy operates and what's the kind of business model and business process difficulties and complexities and what is the kind of employment that they have generated in the country now you know these are the things that are great takeaways uh, from such sessions also you get an opportunity to hop now with someone like Uh, Arjun Malhotra, who's been a veteran in this industry, so absolutely exhilarating experience and uh, a lot of uh, positive uh, takebacks for us. So, welcome to the 27th uh, edition of uh, uh, Data Quest Awards. Uh, Data Quest, uh, since its inception, uh, started recognizing the movers and shakers of the IT industry. Uh, I remember when the industry was a very very small industry; it was under under hundred crores. Today, uh, it is billions of uh, dollars, uh, great market capitalization. Uh, but most importantly, it has affected the lives of each and every Indian by making fundamental changes 
uh, to the way we live, the way we act, the way we behave, the way we uh, go about doing our uh, business. This has been possible because of the contribution that have been made by the people who have made this industry happen, our award winners. So the, that was a work from uh, the jury. Uh, so first of all, to begin uh, today's proceedings, I would like to congratulate uh, Raji uh, on the DataQuest Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, Raji, our journey goes back a long time. IIT Delhi, HCL are shared stages of that uh, journey. Many friends also share the sentiment and will be joining us over the next hour uh, in which we actually are discussing five decades. Now, trying to capture 50 years in, a, is, in an hour is a challenge, but my fellow panelists believe in brevity of, as the soul of the witch, and we will capture the milieu of those times in three minute replies. To begin with, I first want to invite uh, Mr. N. Chandra, chairperson of the Tata Group, to say a few words. Uh, Ashok, can we have uh, Mr. Chandra, please? Ashok, can we have the can we have Mr. Chandra, please? Sir, there is some issue. Uh, I'm trying to fix that. Okay, so uh, so can you? Um, uh, Put me back on. Uh, what we will do is we will uh, start off uh, our discussion. Uh, you know, uh, 80s was the time when the foundation of this industry took place. Uh, this was the time when IBM had left, microprocessors had arrived, some bright youngsters had a dream. But Indian business was highly controlled at that time. Arjun, uh, you know, at that time business was something that was not really looked up to, uh, you know, so what was it like in terms of regulations? What were the challenges faced? I know you can talk for hours on that, but may I request you to capture what was the essence of those times? So, PG, it's a good question. You know, we lived in what was called a license Raj. That means anything you had to make or anything you had to sell, you had to get permission. And the government decided uh, what the market size was, and they sort of gave permission to 120% of some number, but only 80% produced. So you lived in an economy of shortage. So when we decided to leave DCM and start HCL because microprocessors, we thought microprocessors were going to change the world. Uh, we realized we they couldn't get a license to manufacture computers. So that was reserved for state and public sector. So we actually signed a joint sector agreement with the UP Electronics Corporation Uptron as their first, that was their first venture, which is how we got the name Hindustan Computers Limited because we chose it. Every other Uptron company and venture was Uptron something or the other. And that's why we had UP as our home state. And fortunately for us, Noida came up right then and Noida was a part of District Bulanshir. So basically what we did was set up our factory there. Now just to, I'll give you a quick story just to tell you how what the life was like and how naive we were. Uh, when we made our first 8-bit machine, the HCL 8C, we took 30% advance, 70% the check was given when the person came to the factory, saw the machine, and then we packed it and shipped it to them. So the first machine had to go and we were packing it when someone said, have you paid your excise? And so we said, what's excise? And they said, you know, there's a production tax in India and is either paid at volarum, which is the percentage of the value, or by weight, because transformers went at four and as a kilo by weight. So we called the excise inspector. We couldn't find it in the book, the excise manual. So he said the way to do it is you write to your administrative ministry. They will send a letter to the finance ministry, who will then give a classification and tell us how to do it. And we told him, you create the two ministries. It's going to take four or five months. I have to deliver the machine in a day or two. 
He said, no, this is revenue generating for the government. It will get done in one day. So we went, I remember it was a Saturday, half day in those days. And we presented to Department of Electronics, which had just come up. And after the presentation, we were told that, you know, the microprocessor policy has still not been decided. We expect it will take four years. So please come back four years later, and then we'll clear the, we'll write to the finance ministry for you. So, you know, we went back very depressed, had a look at that manual in detail. Fortunately, they were under import substitution. We used to get electromechanical accounting invoicing machines from East Germany, a company called Robotron. And there was a photograph of a keyboard, a small display and a printer. And so we showed that to the excise guy and said, isn't it the same? And he said, yes, it looks the same. So for four years, we cleared our computers as accounting invoicing machines, even sold one to the Department of Electronics. But that policy did take four years. So I just wanted to give a flavor of the kind of environment we were in when we started HCL in, those, in 1976. Interesting times. I think P, you're muted, PG. I'll unmute myself. Yes. Sorry. I mean, that really brought some uh, old memories uh, back to me. Uh, CP, you were not in the IT industry at that time. You know, this is the time when uh, computers were still luxury goods. You know, it was a fancy thing to have. Some few politicians understood what IT was and were trying to push it and they were referred to as the gang of four. You know, Tell me, from an outsider's point of view, how did you look at the IT industry and what made you shift to this industry? I can answer the last question first, which is what made me shift to the IT industry. I was, eight, I was dating Anita, who used to work for NIIT, and uh, Raji was God then, and Raji is still God. And uh, uh, so clearly, I couldn't live in Jaipur and work uh, for Fenner India Limited. Uh, so that's how I really uh, shifted to IT industry. But I think that's the best decision I took in 1986. Since then, I haven't looked back. Uh, but if you ask me uh, what really prompted me, it wasn't really only Anita. Uh, I think the reality was that uh, the computers had started becoming what I would call aspirational product for a corporate. And uh, very few people really understood what the benefits are, but it clearly were influenced that a microprocessor based uh, a PC was now available. And obviously, a company like HCL, which launched BusyBee that year, uh, created full page advertisements uh, and uh, uh, brought in an awareness in India. So I can only say is it was for the ride that I came in. Number three, from a user point of view, uh, when you got in, uh, people you had different stories. Uh, it was still very, very hardware centric. Uh, the different stories were, is it a better calculator? Is it, a, you know, uh, uh, you know, one floppy machine or a two floppy machine? And uh, number three is, is a government product better or a Hindustan computer product better? Because the whole of Department of Electronics had come in, CMC had come in, in 86, NIC had come in, but the world really stopped around these three, com three government bodies to actually talk about computerization. And uh, I'm happy that I played a role uh, because the industry continued to evolve. And uh, to a large extent, that famous story uh, when you when I met Raji uh, and Shiv together, uh, the famous story was that Raji started NIT because the world was manufacturing computers, read as cars, but there were no drivers. And uh, 
Hence the need for the education sector for computer industry. Uh, that's a wonderful story, CP. Yes, I do remember NIIT used to have a dating alarms. Uh, I'm sure you were also one of the beneficiaries of that uh, alarm. I, mean, I, I believe. Like, like anybody else, I, I have a thousand stories <laughs> about uh, eating uh, in front of South Extension, but I think we'll leave it for some other day. <laughs> uh, absolutely. I believe the, the message from uh, Mr. Chandra. So can we uh, please connect uh, uh, Mr. Chandra? Ashok, can you please uh, connect Mr. Chandra? I'm sorry, we are having some problem with the audio. Okay, uh, can can uh, can the tech team just see what really is the issue, and can they set right the audio, please? In the meantime, I shall uh, continue. Uh, uh, so, uh, so Raji, uh, you know, as uh, CP just now said, there was a complete lack of manpower. Uh, you know, how did the idea of NIIT take birth? What were the seeds? I think as uh, CP let the cat out of the bag by saying that in HCL, then there was... Um, DCM and ORG were making computers and after that Wipro. So computers were getting made. That was becoming clear and they were becoming the big story in town. But everybody soon realized that while we'll have the computers, we won't have people to, to run them. So this used to show up in our corporate planning sessions in the SWOT analysis as the biggest threat. And you know, sitting there in the, as in the function of corporate planning, as I was thinking about this threat would block the growth of the industry. And then should this not be a great opportunity? So in a sense, the seeds of NIT were born by realizing that the crucial block to the growth of IT would be talent. And therefore, why not look at that as an opportunity? So the mission statement we made was quite simple uh, of NIT was bringing people and computers together successfully. So well, we started off we soon realized that uh, you need people to create people who will then run computers. So where's the faculty? Now, being engineers, we figured we'd have to find a technical solution. So we introduced the color TV in India was pretty much the first one. So we bought a 29 inch Onida TV, I remember. It was the biggest you could get a color TV. And we bought a huge old uh, Sony VCR, the, the three quarter inch U-Matic, big thing it is because we got imported videotapes of people teaching COBOL and Fortran and so on. So we thought, if we, till we get the teachers, let's use technology. And so therefore, the launch was a multimedia. We used the term in 1982. Um, and uh, the ad we put was, uh, if you have a college degree and no job, this ad can change your life. And the idea was, young, fresh graduates, come into this field and build a future for yourself. But very quickly, we discovered that while there was a lot of interest, a number of constraints came in front of us. So really speaking, the, the, the decade, the early part of the 80s was about solving one constraint after the other. So the first, of course, was getting technology to get teachers, but then we had to repurpose school teachers. So at a very large scale, we ran faculty development programs to convert school teachers into computer teachers in the classroom. And then we needed talent knowledge and we looked at the medical education where the doctors teach and they also practice so we thought we'll consult learn the subject and teach so we became the biggest recruiters of im mbas in those years in fact 1985 i remember out of 19 mbas who majored in systems at im calc we hired 18. and these youngsters came with their notebooks and sat in front of the chairman of indian oil and the others helping them figure out how to build an it plan but through that consulting practice, 
we then created knowledge which we brought into the classroom so the whole medical education model of practitioners creating content and bring it in the classroom was put into use but then we had to scale so the next innovation was how to scale into small cities and we then thought of creating a franchise model uh, which had been tried uh, for uh, you know for mcdonalds and so on but never for a service so the franchising of education as a model was what we created in 86 and that helped us to scale significantly all the way reaching at one time to 2000 locations but there was also policy shortage i think Ar arjun talked about so in a sense fortunately for us uh, when rajiv gandhi arrived on this uh, the scene in 1984 the first policy he announced was the computer policy 84 and 86 was the software and manpower, manpower and software policy. So these two policies at a government level, but I also want to tell you there was a policy taken by one of our wise leaders in the industry, Mr. Kohli, who created DCSS that we all know. He created a policy which helped us. He said that anyone who had been offered a job by DCS would not be joined unless they got a COBOL certificate from an NIT center. We are indebted to TCS and to him because that was also a corporate policy which gave us growth. So this was an era of huge opportunity, many interesting problems to solve and extensive innovation. And that's how the whole thing started off. Great, great to, to uh, hear, you know, how uh, Mr. Kohli, uh, he's now 95 years. Uh, so, you know, may he uh, complete his century. Uh, uh, let me just check at the back end. Is the the uh, audio of Mr. Uh, Chandrasekhar is it sorted out, or we'll just continue? I think we'll just carry on till I get a message from them that the technical issue has been Sir, please uh, taken care of. Sir, please continue. Okay. There is some issue. Sure. So we'll we'll just uh, wait for that. Uh, uh, so Raji, you you talked about you know. Uh, building the uh, the entire basis for the software export industry, but the industry still had few people. You know, you and I were part of that task force, the World Bank study, which was done uh, in the early 90s. How did we end up gaining leadership? You know, India was still looked down upon and so on. What were a few of the factors that made India achieve absolute eminence in this area of software export? Well, essentially, it goes to the caliber of the people, I would say. I mean, essentially, that is it. The whole idea was how do we reach young people and prepare them for the opportunity? And the talent actually showed itself. Now, we have to remember that opportunities opened in front of us. So, 98 policy, Rajiv Gandhi, Sam Petroda were great supporters. They gave us a lot of tailwind. But also came some people like Mr. Vittal, who opened the doors for us as we came toward the end of this first decade. And uh, the world took notice because already work had been done by a few companies like TCS to prove to the Western world that there was a, a ton of talent in this country. So the whole idea was to prepare the talent, bring it to a certain level and put it in front of the market opportunity. And the 90s, of course, we talk about that was a period of great opportunity. But the 80s become a, became the period when we used the domestic market and we used consulting and we used domestic customers for the whole industry to learn. And exceptionally bright people across all these companies who were there at that time with tremendous amount of energy and ability to attract the best talent from the institutions. So I think it was the talent story uh, laid open because then computers arrived and the demand of them. Yeah, uh, you are right. So perhaps, you know, a, a set of uh, talent which was used uh, that was probably, uh, you know, sort of uh, a notch higher than what was actually required by uh, the industry. Perhaps that is what happened during that time. Uh, Arjun, you went to US at that time. Uh, not at that time, I think in the 80s, in the US, uh, you moved in with the story of hardware, but ended up doing software. How did that shift happen from hardware to software? So that's an you know, interesting uh, transition. Actually, uh, HCL's belief was that engineers should do R&D 
and uh, you know programmers should do programming not engineers engineers were really for r and d and we really recruited from the top institutes the iits the so called rcs and what are called nits today and we really went to the us because of again those restrictions that i talked about earlier india was aligned with the so called soviet bloc and so us had restrictions on what they would export to india and our people read the english magazines so they know the latest microprocessors so for example when the 68030 came out from motorola we were only allowed the 68020 and so to give our customers the performance that they wanted and we had a very very strong r and d team in hcl we made a multiprocessor machine which actually was unique because internally it was a multiprocessor but externally the user worked as it was as it was a single processor unix so i didn't have to retrain pre the programmers per se this uh, you know someone from atnt came after they bought unix and they were very impressed because similar machines i mean obviously larger capacity were available only for a million dollars from pyramid and mips in the us ours was a 100000 dollar machine now that's the price we thought we could get in the us and they thought that there would be an opening we got mckenzie to do a study and we went to the us to sell hardware we got a big order for 50 million dollars as soon as we went there and obviously we were then working towards it unfortunately multiple things happened yogesh vaidya who was one of the founders who gone there had to go in for a bypass which was not common in those days he did say he'd get back to work in 10 days but we thought he was going to overdo it and so i was sent out there to make sure that he doesn't put too much uh, strain on his health basically uh, the order went south because the company that had given it to us got acquired by another company which wanted only intel chips not motorola chips and i was too new to the us to realize that if i'd gone legal i would have made a lot of money you know i came from an indian context where you had to run a business you know you wanted to run it properly so we then went uh, to a number of our people i was sent to shut it down basically and uh, we had actually moved people out to uh, to to what port the enabling technologies the compilers the databases onto our hardware so that we could sell it in the us market and the way it was structured was instead of paying for the port we said the engineers were at our cost and we will do the multi processor extensions to your machines uh, to your software which is your ip but it will work on our machine so when i decided to get, stop the hardware business so to say and close it down everyone who was using our engineers said that they wanted those multi processor extensions and we realized we had we had a unique uh, knowledge of how to work multi processor uh, you know how to get performance from the disk how to get performance from your uh for other parts of the system which no people even companies like hp didn't have at that time and so everyone wanted the expertise we had and so that's how we switched from being in the us at least from being a hardware company to actually selling our, uh selling our expertise as a consultant very much like uh, you know a lot of other companies were doing at that time hcl stayed a technology based uh, a services company for a long time we only moved into applications and i take the blame for that delay is because i was never comfortable you know we were always a technology company we used engineers for r and d not for programming it's just that one of our oracle guys who he went to australia came to the us and he told me he needed a job he said i'll run the part that business for you and that's really how hcl got into the application business basically that that's really the story behind how we switched from hardware to <laughs> services in the us <laughs> and of course uh, uh, then came uh, uh, you know the y2k opportunity so uh, ct was it an opportunity which sort of just fell in india's lap uh, was there uh, just uh, uh, that we were at the right place at the right time uh, walk us through through that uh, time period you know again uh, uh, you know one bug has stopped the world the other bug that we are talking about uh, could have stopped the whole uh, financial institution the governments the hospitals and you name it 
you know, sometimes you have to be lucky. And I, the reason I'm saying we had to be lucky was that Y2K bug was inability of the computers to differentiate between the year 1900 and 2000. Uh, clearly, India's advantage uh, of having a scale of engineering talent, uh, the good education system, uh, did help us. Now, to gain credibility, every company had its own way of addressing it. Uh, you know, Arjun used to be uh, in Etsil America. Arjun came across a company in Virginia called James Martin and Company. I mean, uh, the, the, the James Martin professor uh, was very, very good at methodology. He did write, talk about uh, the impending uh, crisis because of I2K. And we ended up working with James Martin, ended up acquiring James Martin and company. But different companies, other companies made their own tools to migrate. Uh, some people invested a lot and maybe Rajiv's Cobol engineers uh, became the premium engineers. But I look back and say, why Y2K helped uh, the Indian industry? And I'm sure, uh, you know, we at NASCOM have often said, while Father Kohli helped create the export industry, but real recognition came to India because of Y2K. The reasons, again, number one, the regulator. Most of the regulators made it compulsory to mandatorily test the software. It was probably the most painful for the user organizations. And uh, India Incorporated, obviously, was the first time actually going deep into the application software. Number two was that, you know, everybody started realizing they had millions of lines of code. It was never documented. Uh, most of us don't realize post Y2K, we benefited because the documentation had taken place that was quality processes or the CMM level now started looking real. Uh, I think if I look back, uh, I can only say learning from this bug and uh, this bug means COVID-19 bug and the Y2K bug, that the public trust is sacred. It must be nourished during the times of the crisis. India incorporated benefited because we not only delivered, but we maintained the trust of the client. So I think uh, there is a lesson here for us in COVID-19 and that trust that we maintained in the uh, year 2000, if we continue, we will benefit in 2020 also. I, I like that your, your analogy that, you know, it was one bug uh, that was beneficial. And today we are uh, looking at yet another uh, bug. Uh, but Raji, just uh, was uh, uh, CP just continuing with you, uh, you know, then came the millennium, uh, internet flattened the world. Uh, this was the time when the entire industry started moving up the value chain, you know, started moving from time and material to projects. There was a, a new uh, area also that came up, which was IT ES industry. Uh, this was the time when there was, uh, you know, very strong growth of the entire Indian IT software industry. Uh, you know, what was the role of manpower and how did that entire thing come about? Your views on that? Uh, again, uh, uh, I mean, it's fun uh, being on this panel because for a change, we are not discussing 5G and AI. Uh, and we are really discussing what brought us up to this point. Uh, when I look back, the other benefit of your Y2K was that we could never send so many people overseas. So the connectivity between the mainframes of the client and us, I mean, I still remember 
uh, you know, taking clients that Arjun will send from overseas uh, and taking them on the top of the building to show that we have an antenna. And uh, those dumb terminals uh, that we would connect uh, onto those mainframes, but we were working from offshore. So the, the fact is that offshore industry got into the multiply mode was because thanks to year 2000. And number two, uh, I think around that time, I don't have the exact years, but it's around that time when American Express started moving its back offices to India. And American uh, the Express gave it the first credibility that an ITS industry could be operated out of India. Obviously, the Pramod Basin and the Genpak story is very, very well known that GE started their back office operations and Jack Walsh had the famous dialogue 70-70-70. I personally believe that uh, in a lot of ways, uh, while ITS industry was being created, India's role in running an enterprise remotely, India's role in being able to do an application management remotely, and some of the Indian companies, uh, you know, on one end were doing the augmenting of the manpower, but some of the companies had started moving into managed services. And that is why when you see the growth curve, uh, you know, I don't remember exactly, but I think NASCOM in the last February projected that India's exports was about $177 billion and it has continued to grow. And this is really from a very small base. Uh, so when you start becoming such a heavyweight on the GDP, and when you start looking at how the customer's confidence continued to grow in you, that today we probably have about 1,000 global delivery centers of the customers based in India. That an IBM or an Accenture will have more manpower in India than anywhere else in the world. I think that is where the, 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 the our contribution to the global IT industry more important is that we have continued to add value to a company, whether it is called an Intel or a Microsoft or an SAP or an Oracle or the top 100 companies in the world. Thanks, thanks, CP. I'm told that I'm told that the problem, uh, the technical hitch that we were having is sorted out. Can we have, uh, therefore, can we have Mr. Chandra, please? Raju is a true pioneer. He had a vision long years to develop the human capital in the IT industry to drive the nation's growth. He believed in two important things to demonstrate growth. First, India had the human capital to solve its problems. And the second, the IT skills can be built. He founded NAIT in the 1980s on these two principles. Today, NAIT is present in over 30 countries and forms over 35 million learners. Raji is a true educationist at heart. He served on the board of governors of IFB and also founded the NAIT University. He helped shape the IT policy in India and around the world. Raji's contribution to education, the IT industry, and the nation at large is enormous. He is a role model for many young entrepreneurs to take a premise, build on it, and bring it into reality. Always executing, persevering, and making it better. I cannot think of anyone else to receive this Data First Lifetime Achievement Award other than Raji. Congratulations. 
thank you thank you very much chandra can we also have uh, the message uh, from devjani ghosh please okay uh, perhaps we will just continue our discussion uh, so raji uh, you know uh, the internet also changed the shape of education in the country right uh, more formal education came also there was democratization uh, that happened in terms of you know more people having access to information and so on uh, it also uh, sort of you know uh, brought in uh, focus on skills walk us through that shift that took place in the entire education system so the internet as we know came in 1995 and the speed at that time you may remember was 9.6 kilobits per second imagine that in fact we were the first to build a virtual university on the internet we called it net varsity in 1996 only to discover that nothing moved on the screen so in fact we created net varsity got our students to spend part of the time on it but then we ended up sending them the floppy disk to their home with some internet material so they could simulate the internet and even when we came to 2004 which is now the second we are talking about the speed was 256 kbps in fact 2010 it was 512 kbps so in that whole decade decade it was quite impossible to think of democratizing education through technology it was not through online options so democratization happened the digital divide problem had been labeled and raised in the late 90s by many political leaders uh, sm krishna chandra babu naidu mrs dikshit they were all our students by the way we had the privilege of saying that they wanted us to solve the digital divide problem so we embarked on a number of things everybody has heard i'm sure of sugata's work on the hole in the wall which basically said uh, first we did the government projects we did uh, IT projects to teach children computers in village schools, and those were system integration projects, end to end. We took a room, we put up computers, we put the AC, we put the furniture, we sent a teacher, we gave the courseware to make sure that village children could learn. And in that decade, we trained 10 million young kids with physical classrooms and teachers, mind you. So democratization started, but not with the internet, unfortunately. the hole in the wall experiment actually said what if you don't even have a teacher so children in slum so we connected computers we got a very good funded project from the world bank to demonstrate that you could indeed have children learn computers on their own and <clears throat> then in 2007 we also started another experiment for democratization which was in a small town called chindwara uh, mr kamalnath was then the minister he said look you are doing big things in the cities what about my small down and we built what we then called the uh, model district learning center where we worked with the local government got some space put some technology we tried to do remote teaching and we used such methods to reach the unreachable and the unreached so i have to say that the leaders in the government were very very conscious about the digital divide problem and we got the opportunity in that decade of 2000 2010 to do a number of things to democratize but i have to say internet didn't help till we came into the next decade that that really was a reality <laughs> oh yeah but it did create a huge amount of connectivity so you know that was the big advantage i believe uh, uh, you know uh, can we have uh, uh, the message from devjani ghosh uh, president of nasca <laughs> Then you this ago, uh, Raji. You've been a friend, philosopher, guide to NASCOM, and definitely to me, uh, pretty much from the beginning of the journey, uh, right from the start. If I'm not wrong, uh, you've been part of our executive council. You've been a past chairman of NASCOM, and even today, you continue to find the time for us and act as chairman of the Data Security Council of India. Uh, Raji, your contributions, your insights are always invaluable. 
um, your ability to get into depth of specific subjects, attention to details, and always, you know, the, the willingness with which um, you, you make yourself available wherever we reach out to you, it means a lot. And to me personally, Raji, you played a very, very critical role in pretty much changing my life. You were one of those few people who played matchmaker uh, between me and NASCOM. And I can, cannot thank you enough for it uh, because joining NASCOM was one of those absolutely life-changing moments for me. And I am ever so grateful to you for giving me that opportunity. Um, as we enter the fourth decade for the industry, uh, you know, this is a great time to take a look back at that time and place where it all started. Um, at that point, we had a fledgling IT industry with very big dreams, ambitions of becoming a global superpower. The industry leaders at that time, including Raji, played a stellar role in articulating the advantage of India as an IT hub, the talent base that we had, the cost advantage we had, and how it all came together to give global companies, global uh, IT Fortune 500 companies, uh, the best partner that they could have for their uh, digital journeys. And I have to give it to the, the folks who made it happen, including Raji, because they were so convincing. They believed in their power of their ideas to such a large extent that they were able to not just convince customers around the world, but they were able to convince the government of India that there's to realize the tremendous potential in Indian IT and take the steps needed to set up this industry. You know, as we, as we look at the moment in time that we are in today, with COVID-19 pretty much disrupting all our lives, um, it's a great time to think back to the last bug that pretty much reshaped the Indian IT industry. And I'm talking about Y2K. That was a strategic inflection point for the industry and provided the industry with an opportunity to accelerate growth like never before. I do believe that today, once again, we are at that moment in time when we have a huge opportunity to reinvent and to reshape the industry and become the most trusted partner for the solution for the world's business. And with people like Raji, Continuing to mentor us, continuing to support us, I do believe that this industry will emerge stronger from the crisis than ever before. And this one is pretty much ours to win. Thank you. <clears throat> so, you know, this decade, uh, Arjun, also saw entrepreneur entrepreneurship emerging out of India. You know, you were in Silicon Valley where the 90s, there was this huge wave of entrepreneurship and so on. And a lot of people got infused by that. And therefore, this wave uh, started here in India also. The first decade was really the formation of that uh, uh, big change in India. Uh, how critical was that? So, you know, I think uh, we've got to go back to what the IT industry did uh, for people. So. For someone like me, when I graduated from college, uh, security, job security or getting a job, a secure job was probably the most important thing. In fact, my parents were quite clear that as long as I was studying, they would support me. The minute I finished studies, I better support myself, find a job, right? Uh, so security was really important, which is one reason why I'm surprised we were able to think and start of HCL way back in 75. But by the time the IT industry had got to that point, I think that glass ceiling, that security glass ceiling for the middle class had pretty much broken. You could talk to, you know, when you went to an IIT or you went to colleges to recruit people, they would talk about starting something straight out of college. Uh, you know, just starting a company, becoming entrepreneurs, uh, which was actually a new word for us. We, we didn't know what that meant when we started. But I think that was number one. And number two, you've got to remember that in India, technology is a strong point. And so when the internet came, suddenly you had a new technology that was going to change the world again in some way. Uh, no one knew in what way at that time and how quickly. But 
that allowed a lot of people who had strength and comfort in technology and knowledge in technology to get the how should i put it to get the confidence to then jump in and do something on their own and i know at that time how much time we spent trying to tell people that go to market or going to market is also critical it's not you may have the best product in the world but if you don't know how to take it to a customer and sell it it's not going to go anywhere but i think the combination of the fact that psychologically the it industry had uh, broken the glass barrier the glass ceiling for the middle class and the fact that we had a new technology like the internet come in i think a combination of those two is what really gave a big boost to entrepreneurship in india at that time no absolutely i think uh, uh, those were the, the formative years for entrepreneurship uh, in the country uh, so you know raji let's talk about the last uh, 10 years uh, and you did refer to uh, to you know uh, an id varsity coming up uh, in the, the late 90s and so on uh, you know you were actually the, the nid was the first unicorn i think you know the first billion dollar market cap was reached by nid uh, and then edtech took a sort of a back seat and now it has emerged very very strongly again uh, was nid ahead of its time uh, you know what needs to be done in order uh, to catch this new uh, edtech revolution that is taking place yeah i think it's fair to say that uh, we like to look far ahead very often too far ahead so 1996 was net varsity then 2002 we launched nid online limited same kind of problem 20 13 we announced the cloud campus which basically by now you know the internet speeds are coming to 512 kbps and the cloud campus basically said that it's, it's your place on the cloud you can work from anywhere you can collaborate with anybody you can visit the lab online so all of these things by the way the tools and technologies have been ready but the, the infrastructure wasn't ready and we do know that in the last um, in this decade the the mooc phenomena started 2012 so the the first few of them were a great source of excitement for all of us except that they still couldn't get the business model right that in the us the infrastructure was okay but everybody imagine that if you connect a learner to a device like is happening on zoom then learning happens only to discover that learning is the most complicated process and therefore completion rates on free education online is 5 or 6% leave alone when you start charging so but the good news is that i think many like us have dabbled with this i mean we started using i told you multimedia which was a vcr and a tv in 1981 and then we were the first to use the laser disc we were the first to use computers in training the first to use web series so we have been uh, let's say time has been trying to chase us if i can I, i can put it that way but we've come to a point where the cumulative experience which we've gained is now with us so the university and i the university which we conceptualized in the late 90s but started only in uh, 2009 is predicated on the reality of technology being the infrastructure so any digital in these days of covid time we have our students who have a much better time than the others similarly nit the whole idea of physical infrastructure become less and less and less relevant because learners want to learn wherever they are whenever they are on whatever device they want and therefore commuting and changing we used to have an ad, ad at one time in nit that mr so and so left from home changed this bus and that bus and that bus to reach our nit center that was the usp now no one wants to do that so now people want to learn online so we are in the process of launching nit digital but it's not not just about zoom i think the education process is far too complex and we are hoping that all that we've learned through these early experiences now that time is catching up with us we will have uh, the opportunity but i do want to say that the global digital platform for a corporate customers that's now 80% of our activity uh 80% of our activity now is for the 50 of the fortune 500 companies the unilevers of the world for whom we are doing the internal training remotely and we are in that we are one of the two global companies of pure play training companies in the world 
and growing faster than the other player. So while the B2B model is in place, is now the B2C, the NIT digital that we're looking at, and of course, NIT, NU, NIT University Digital is with us. So we actually are looking at COVID, and I think uh, Dev Jani made a very good point. This bug, and I'll talk about that a little later, is the next opportunity yeah. for India. Yeah, and so just, this, just the world is going digital. Just, just hold that because you know uh, that's the next ten years, and I think that is very critical. Uh, what what is going to happen as far as the future is concerned? Uh, yeah, uh, we have a message also from uh, uh, Rishad the Premji. Uh, can I uh, can we play that message, please? Uh, sorry, sir. There is some technical glitch with his video as well. So, can you continue with the discussion? In meanwhile, I'll manage that. Sir, you are on mute. Easy, sir. You are on mute. Mute. Okay. Uh, so, you know, uh, Raji talked about how the education industry has changed. A CP, similar changes have taken place in the software services industry as well. You know, so what uh, do you see? How can we move up the value chain? What, uh, what is uh, the agenda? What have been the last 10 years for the entire industry? In a lot of ways. Uh, so, so let's take the few events that uh, have taken place. Number one, that a TCS would have a more than a trillion dollar market cap, or uh, you know, many of us would be managing critical services. Uh, you know, what was earlier called, you know, the fault tolerant machines now became. Hardware became software, and software also the level of fault tolerance that was a that had to be provided. That means you had to give 99.999 level of uh, uh, you know uptime. India Incorporated has continued to move up the value chain. Uh, there is no newspaper in the world which will not talk about the India's capabilities. There is no new product in the world, whether it is an aircraft or a washing machine, or whether it is a automobile or any Fortune 500 company or the top 10 tech companies, which today can claim that they do not have an India inside. I mean, the, the joke in the Silicon Valley is it is not only India inside. I mean, if you ask too many questions, you will find Indian CEO inside. So moving up the value chain, I think, is uh, almost uh, an everyday process. And why am I using this as an everyday process? If you remember, see. Uh, Cognizant Technologies came up with this slogan, two in the box, which was really saying is that we will put in an account executive and also put in a delivery executive right in front of you. Very same, the same Cognizant came back and said it is three in the box. Why it was three in the box is because now we can also consult for you. We can also do your high level design and we can now create what is called an end-to-end -end service offering from consulting to maintenance. Uh, coming to the new world, uh, almost everybody that you talk to is talking about migration, 
to digital, migration to cloud, migration to 5G, migration to 5, AI. Similarly, if you probe further, then how do you make your business digital? How do you modernize so that your business becomes digitally native? And the good news is that India Incorporated is part of those conversations. And uh, when you look back and look at the acquisitions of McKinsey or a Bain or a BCG have made, they bought more technology companies in the last five years than they have bought consulting capabilities, which effectively means is that today's environment calls for a technology as the layer. And uh, personally, I'm very encouraged when people start using uh, India example of an Aadhaar or the Jandhan Yojana when a geo platform is now discussed in every boardroom around the world that we would be able to combine a native technologies and be able to create a, you know a velocity in every kind of a digital marketplace it just gives you the confidence that India's Aadhaar is an example of a, a, a database of such a huge size, secure and serving the people. I think the next leap has to take place. Whether the next leap is happening in education, healthcare, I'm sure, PG, whenever we are ready to talk uh, about the next decade, there are many, many ideas that we can throw on the table. Absolutely. And uh, uh, incidentally, uh, we are ready with uh, a message which is from a former brand ambassador of uh, NIIT. So can we uh, play that video, please? I first met Raji in 1999 when I began working with NIIT. And one of the things that struck me right away was the calm around him. And uh, soon I observed a lot of very good leadership qualities. Very few things that really ruffled him. The first thing I noticed was his passion for education and for overcoming the digital divide. For him, computers weren't only about IT, they were about education. I remember in uh, 2000, he had a conversation with the president of the World Chess Federation who mentioned that uh, in his region, he had introduced chess in schools and this produced uh, much better academic outcomes for his students. And Raji's eyes lit up. And one of the things he immediately focused on was uh, whether we could launch the same thing in India. Within a year, we had launched the Nine Champions Academy. Quite a few champions have emerged from this academy where we make chess available to students all across the nation. His passion for education and IT uh, was very important in the 80s. Uh, and during this pandemic, I think we can appreciate the foundation that was done then. Um, India is so much better prepared for uh, all the communication tools and the IT that we need because of this work. I also see him as a mentor. And um, I remember one conversation where um, a couple of times in my career when I had difficult moments, I consulted him. And in 2013, I was in one of the lows of my career, having lost my world title. And Raji told me to take stock of my life and then, you know, how much had gone right. And this was just one step back. I could shrug it off and uh, it was right. Uh, the last six years, I have been playing chess. And uh, in fact, I was much more left to do, uh, even after losing my title. I have enjoyed uh, knowing him personally at many levels, not only professionally. Uh, I have visited his family many times. Uh, a very close and I've always enjoyed his uh, sense of humor uh, and the warm times we've spent together. Uh, my congratulations to Raji on his Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, all the best. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vishi, for uh, uh, those wishes. And I'm so happy that you were able to take some time out uh, and uh, be with us on this uh, day. Um, uh, Arjun, uh, 
you know, we were talking about entrepreneurship. In the last 10 decades, you know, Stand Up India, Start Up India, entrepreneurship has come uh, to fore. But I want you to have a nostalgic look and talk about entrepreneurship as it was in the 80s and the entrepreneurship as it, as it exists now. You know, I'm sure you've got lots of uh, juicy stories, but perhaps one or two things which capture the flavor. So, yeah, PG, I, the thing that comes to mind immediately is, you know, when we started HCL way back uh, in the mid-70s, uh, we started with uh, 1,75,000 rupees. And at that time, you had to have an office in Bombay. You couldn't rent, you had to buy. So out of the 1 lakh 75, 1 lakh 25,000 went to buy an office in Cuff Parade in Bombay, 953 square feet, I still remember, at Regent Chambers. And so the working capital in the company was really 50,000 rupees. 10 years later, when we were, you know, we got together at Udaipur, the six founders, and uh, we were celebrating, we had 2,000 people, company was doing quite well. You know what was strange was that the one lakh twenty five we had invested in real estate in Bombay had probably given us a better return than the fifty thousand we had invested in the company, right? So that was I just want to give you an idea of that was real entrepreneurship. Uh, that was what it meant in those days. In fact, uh, the founders did not see any real wealth till they were in the business for about twenty years. So it's very different today. When you look at things today, you've got VC money, you've got a lot of competition, your window of opportunity is much shorter, your time to market becomes much, much more uh, difficult. And actually, what the internet, and if you look at things like Airbnb, Uber, a uh, lot of other such Ola, you know, what you're doing is looking at available resources that are spare, a house that's empty for one month when you go for a holiday, you can you can monetize it in some way. So we are actually optimizing our resources, optimizing our infrastructure. And we've now got technology that allows us to do it. And so you're going to see a lot more of this happen. I had someone talk to me the other day about uh, setting up a laundry service where he's got housewives whose washing machines are not fully uh, idle most of the time. And they can use those washing machines for people who don't have the time to do it and are willing to pay a certain amount to get it done. I mean, you can get to that point as long as you've got the process to handle it. So I think entrepreneurship as it was then, it was very different as it is now is, is actually completely different. Every And with technology changing so fast, new ideas, new opportunities, uh, new possibilities are coming in all the time. You know, businesses have to adapt and have to adapt really quickly. I mean, we've seen huge companies like Kodak go down because film went away to digital. I mean, you're going to see that happen more and more over time uh, with a lot of companies. And I think the opportunity is there for the young people to go grab it. And that's why when we look at new products today, yeah, there's, there's one way you sell to the baby boomers, which is people like me. There's one way you sell to the uh, uh, millennials. And there's another way you sell to the new generation, uh, whatever you call them, the Z generation, Z generation, Y generation, whatever you call them. And you have to make your, your message is different. What you're trying to sell them is different. The product, in a way, has to look different because they have different choices that they're buying. So I think the world has changed a lot from what it was, I mean, 50 years ago when we started this thing. I think it's, 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 it's a lot more fun today, you know. Uh, because it's not just computers. I think computers, as uh, CP mentioned, has become the infrastructure. You've now got biotechnology, you've got nanotechnology, you've got lots of things coming in where computation is the basis on which all this will become uh, new products, new ideas that hopefully will make my life easier as I get older. Thanks. That's really uh, very well put, uh, uh, Arjun. Uh, we have uh, a message, uh, Raji, from one of your mentors. So may I request uh, uh, that Dr. Karan Singh's video be played, please? Indeed, very well. 
deserve the award because he has made a substantial contribution to the growth of the Indian IT sector by creating skilled manpower to drive its momentum. He is the chairman and co founder of NIIT Limited, which became a global leader in skills and talent development uh, around the world. He is not only known in India, but in many countries of the world, the NIIT has made a substantial contribution. He also set up some time ago a university, a technological university, if you like to call it, in Nimra. Pakistan, or the NIIT University, or the NU as we call it. And we wanted him to be, to be transfer of that university. And I agree, because he and his father had been involved with my family for a long time. And I have known him ever since he was a very young man, and I've watched his rise uh, to a start of his career with great pleasure. So I agreed to become chancellor of this university. It was a green field university. There was nothing there at all. But in 10 years, I saw the way that that university came up, brick by brick, literally. It was every year when I went, I could see the new construction. And under the guidance of uh, Rajendra Pawar and his excellent team of technologists and uh, intellectuals, this has become now a very significant technological university. So, Rajinder Kumar has made several contributions to NIID and through the university to the Indian uh, technological scene. I wish it well in the future. I hope he goes from strength to strength. I'm sure that he's still a young man. He's got a long way to go. He will continue to make his uh, contribution towards uh, the development of India and particularly in this technological age, we will help uh, millions of people to come to terms with the use of time. He has already received the Padma uh, Bhutan, and hopefully he will receive higher honors in the year. I warm greeting to him and to all his organizations. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, uh, CP, I have uh, one uh, last question for you. Uh, you know, you talked about the India advantage. So, you know, uh, what will be those things which will sustain the India advantage in your opinion? You know, uh, one minute on that, please. A long answer, but I think what will change India is the prevalence of technology in everything that an entrepreneur is doing. Uh, we have seen that 18 unicorns that India has produced. Uh, my belief is that the second part which will change India is if we realize that nothing will become, you know, allow us to become the, uh, the prowesses that we want to become, unless everything has AI inside in India. I mean, every government department, every railway, every aircraft will have to start legislating the way we made policy changes to create a COBOL engineer or to create an IT. I think we will have to legislate uh, AI inside for everyone. And number third, my belief is that uh, uh, this geopolitical situation, the wars around us actually convert into India advantage. Uh, so the more aspirational we are, uh, I think we will, uh, instead of just being a service provider or services provider, we will start becoming a process as a service, product as a service. And in many cases, we might see the technology products being made by India, made in India. I mean, I love this Atman Nirbhar thing. I love the way India is trying to tackle 5G by the India stack. I think that will give a huge impetus to India. PG, I have to leave. So Thanks. is it okay if I add a few words for Raji? Please. I know 
please. Yeah, please. Rajiv, I mean, I can only say differently that both Neeti and you have showered your love on me and Anu. And uh, for us, every moment that we have spent with Neeti and you is the most treasured moment. Please continue to share your affection. We are genuinely delighted uh, with your new promotion of being, uh, you know, Data Quest uh, Lifetime Achievement of the Year. But I know uh, the best of Raji is yet to come, and we want to be there as cheerleaders. So congratulations again, Raji. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. being uh, with us uh, today on this uh, occasion. Uh, uh, Arjun, uh, you know, uh, you've been talking about, uh, you're, you're now an investor, okay, and you've been investing in a lot of companies that are essentially looking at the transformation of India, you know, the transformation of Bharat, I should say, healthcare, education, energy, and so on. Uh, so, you know, your views on what is going to be the next uh, decade as far as this, these changes are concerned in terms of the social fabric of the country? So the first thing is I don't invest myself does the investments because, you know, that's not the part that I understand at all. I'm an ops kind of person. But yes, I think uh, what, I want, what I want to do and what I'm trying to do is to work to leverage technology or to use technology to leverage the quality of education and healthcare, and to provide better outcomes, especially in healthcare, better outcomes to the economically underprivileged. And really, COVID has given it a big, big boost because a lot of our telemedicine solutions, a lot of the other solutions are actually uh, starting to, I mean, right now, I don't know how to put it, but we are, growth is the problem. And I mean, that's a very nice thing to say when you're in a startup. But uh, the bottom line is, if you look at what's happening in India, is because the economy is picking up, the number of people who can afford to come into the so-called healthcare system is going up 12 to 18 percent, depending on what the rate of the economy is. But the number of doctors is only going up by six percent. And if I want new doctors, I have to, and I invest today, I'll get them 10 years later. And we're not seeing that investment. So. Every doctor I know, and probably you know, is also overworked today. So what is going to happen over 10 years or more when these doctors have a lot more patients? So I think what we're trying to do is, and DP mentioned it, is use technology, AI, stuff like that, to try and, uh, how, to, how do I put it, reduce or take away the non-patient-facing time that doctors have so that they can see more patients. Because they are the ultimate, I mean, I can get machines to do analysis and diagnostics for you, but I don't think uh, at least our generation will trust a machine. They still want a doctor, an individual to do it for them. But you're going to see it happen. I think the first area you're going to see it happen is in X-ray and MRI imaging, where machine learning based AI systems are going to actually be able to predict much better than doctors on where and what the problems are likely to be so that the doctors can finally sign off on it. It's already happening. And you're going to start seeing more and more of that infiltrate into other medical disciplines uh, where technology will support doctors to become more efficient, to see more patients, and to be more accurate. Right, it's going to take time, but it's going to happen. And in India, especially when you're remote, in a remote village, you can get a doctor, if you can get a doctor to consult, and if they can print out the prescription on a Bluetooth printer right there, and especially with our connectivity on uh, the internet and phones, uh, 2G at least is available everywhere. We can actually make this work. It's starting to work. You can put, uh, you know, telemedicine solutions on trains. So if someone is not feeling well on a train, they can consult with the doctor, at, let's say, at a railway hospital, and uh, at the next stop. Uh, you can have whatever is necessary available for them in case you need something at that point. You can do it at railway stations. You know, so the ability to connect with the doctor uh, after going through an asynchronous system that actually does the diagnostics for you 
so that the doctor doesn't have to spend time just sitting in front of the terminal waiting for the next patient is going to be quite amazing. And we are starting to see that in India. When you look at education, you know, of course, digitizing content is one big thing. But, you know, you look at the US today, some 20, they claim some 20, 25 percent of the kids have some learning disability, you know, whether it's visual, hearing, ADHD, some learning disability. And you have to adapt that digital content that the publishers have to be able to, to be accessible to them. And so accessibility is a big thing that's going to come up. And it's going to come up in countries like India, where unfortunately, because of the past, we have so many stunted kids. So we need to find a way, if we want to educate them, we need to find a way of doing it. So I think you're going to see technology starting to play a bigger and bigger role as we go forward, especially in these two areas. I mean, of course, it's going to play a role in every area, but I'm actually just looking at these two areas, mainly healthcare and to some extent education, where we're trying to see how we can leverage technology. Raji, of course, is the best guy to talk about education, so I'm not spending time on that. But definitely in healthcare, we are starting to see uh, technology make a difference. And you'll probably hear about it in the next few years to see how this will happen. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Arjun. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, that. Uh, Raji, uh, you know, I uh, mentioned earlier that we'll talk about the new bug. Uh, later on. So this is the time now. Uh, you know, COVID uh, has made some permanent, uh, you know, folks in the road. Uh, technology, which was sort of optional in the past, has now become mandatory. Uh, you know, we have woken up to the fact that we cannot uh, avoid that. And therefore, there is going to be more and more deep uh, tech, which is going to get into each and everything. Uh, so how does, uh, how, how do we prepare for it? Uh, you know, how do youngsters prepare for it? How do companies prepare for it? How does the government prepare for it? <clears throat> so, I think the first good news is that the government itself is scaling up its capacity to deal with deep tech. More and more IITs, a large number of triple IITs, many colleges have good capability. So, uh, one part is that the physical institutions are growing, the capacity is growing and we need to do more and more. But let's look at the digital infrastructure. I was talking about just a few years ago, half a megabit per second. Today, mobile internet is at 10 plus megabits. And the internet penetration is now 700 billion people. So the picture is changing. And since 2015, when we started talking of the industry 4.0, which is AI, machine learning, IoT, cloud, um, augmented reality, virtual reality, all these are newer things which will sit on the top of powerful infrastructure to make things more human. Um, so I can say that I, we can see ourselves around ourselves that in addition to government institutions, in the last decade or so, we are also seeing a large number of our successful entrepreneurs adding on to what the Tatas and Birlas have done, but in much larger number that newer institutions are being set up. So I see this period of this last decade and the next one or two as a period when India's new Ivy League universities are getting formed to supplement the effort that the government does. And these universities, and ours is just one of them, many, are looking at deep tech. They are looking at quantum. They have to look at biocomputing. They have to look at cyber. They have to look at sentiment analysis. There are so many things they have to look at the future at 5G and 6G. While companies such as NIT Limited are looking at NIT Digital to teach skills and languages, which is to do the day job and then to look at the future as well. And I think so we will see, we are seeing capacity building happening across the board to build deep tech, to prepare for it, and to, to go forward. And I also want to say that for myself, we see um, Arjun talked so convincingly and nicely about the whole startup phenomena and the new mindset of the youth. Uh, for us, an aspiration at the university is to be the school of startups. And I have to mention that the university benefits and has benefited enormously from the wisdom 
of people in our industry. Even today, the board has so Mittal as a board member. Mohan Reddy used to be on our board, um, and um, uh, we have Arjun Malhotra, of course. And our industry is coming to work with universities much better. New initiatives are happening. So I think the capacity of the nation to build superior talent is going up. The capacity of the nation to build infrastructure to, to reach every village. I think it has been talked this time in the new education policy. There is a commitment to, be, to take the connection to the last village and to give a device to the last child. That needs to be speeded up because the caliber and potential of every child uh, is sitting there. And I think we have to unleash it. So that's what we have to do. So uh, uh, thanks a lot, uh, uh, Raji, for sort of, you know, uh, showing the future direction in which uh, things will unravel. Uh, with that, we come to an end uh, to this uh, panel discussion. I thank uh, CP, I thank uh, Arjun, I thank you for a very invigorating uh, discussion. I think to the best of our abilities, we have sort of tried to capture the nostalgia of uh, these last 40 years. Uh, with that, uh, uh, Raji, while you stay on the stage, Arjun and I will uh, take leave. I will request uh, uh, Ibrahim Ahmed to, to come and read uh, the citation. Sir, you are on mute. Yes. Uh, thank you so much, uh, PG. <clears throat> it's really an honor to be uh, reading the citation for uh, Mr. Uh, Pawar. Uh, obviously, all the great people we heard today have sort of uh, encapsulated whatever we wanted to say in the uh, citation. In fact, uh, we had initially a citation which was about running into five pages and then we shortened it and then we further shortened it and then PG was putting pressure that no, no, we don't have time. Please pick up the only important points. However, before I, 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 uh, I read out the, uh, the, the an even concise form of the citation that we have, I will just narrate a, a story about uh, Mr. Pawar, uh, which I saw personally with my eyes uh, several years back. I don't know if he would even remember. So uh, I live in Gurgaon uh, in NCR Delhi and I was going to office and it was a it was monsoons middle of the monsoons and then uh, I saw that there was a huge jam and there was a crossing and on all sides of the roads uh, on the crossing there was a jam and I think one side was half a kilometer another side was another half a kilometer and then we waited in the car for some time and then I got down and walked up to see what's happening and and there I saw, you will not believe it, I saw uh, a, a, a tall, lean person who had uh, <clears throat> rolled up his sleeves and pulled up his pants. And uh, he was actually uh, monitoring the uh, traffic and he was trying to get the jam finished. And uh, it was Mr. Mr. Pawar. And I saw that some people were telling him that, please, sir, you carry on. You might be missing your important meeting and all. But he continued there. I think he stayed there for almost half an hour till the jam was completely cleared and then only he left. So that's the kind of heroes that we are honoring today. And uh, these, clearly these heroes are not just uh, leaders and visionaries, but they are people who, who really practice and believe in the hands-on uh, approach. And I'm really very proud. Uh, sir, uh, the Data Quest uh, Awards jury was unanimous in its recognition of your outstanding contribution in organizing and building the Indian IT training industry from where it was over 40 years ago to today. You have been a father figure for the entire tech training community in India and the ICT industry to the various initiatives. And <clears throat> that also shows your commitment to give back to the industry, the country and the society. Your current roles in various initiatives will continue to help in building the technology training ecosystem, not just in India, but globally. The DataQuest Awards jury and the editors of DataQuest and Cyber Media are very proud to confer the DataQuest Lifetime Achievement Award of the year 2019 on Mr. Rajender S. Pawar, the chairman and co-founder of NIT 
Limited and founder of NIT University. Thank you so much, sir. And now, can I congratulations? And can I now uh, invite you to say a few words uh, on this award, Mr. Pawar? Thank you so much for your very kind words. Um, but if you don't clear the traffic, you get stuck, so you've got to do it. And one has to do it more and more with the passage of time. So in any case, thank you so much. Uh, you know, among the dark clouds of COVID, this event is a silver lining for me. And thanks to PG and all his wonderful folks, this special way of celebrating um, <clears throat> makes it possible for me to reach many people who would otherwise have been st stuck in traffic or at work. And I could never have reached so many of my mentors, colleagues, relatives and friends through your digital event. <clears throat> I received this award on behalf of thousands of my colleagues of the NIT family, NITians, of the past and NITNs of the present, all of whom put organization building above all else. <clears throat> Led remarkably well by my colleagues Vijay Thadani, Rajendran, Arvind Thakur. Along this journey of over four decades, <clears throat> I've had the good fortune of getting unconditional support, advice, guidance and affection from so many of you, I'll make every possible effort to thank each of you in person, not through this digital method. I owe the launch of my entrepreneurial career to Shiv Nader, entrepreneur and mentor par excellence, and to a lot of guidance from Arjun, who I used to work with in my early years in HCL. I have received blessings and the affection of Mr. F.C. Kohli, whose passion, wisdom, and tenacity has set very high standards for all of us in the industry. <clears throat> to all the members of my family and my extended family, I will say this. While my preoccupation with work came at the cost of my not giving enough time to you, each and every one of you has continued to shower endless affection and love. Thank you ever so much from the bottom of my heart. There is one person, however, who needs to be at the center of receiving all the credit <clears throat> today. And I mean all the credit that I'm being credited for. And that is the love of my life, Niti Pawar. <clears throat> so 42 years you've been by my side as a perfect partner. Solid as a rock, selfless to the core, a fountain of, fountainhood of affection for all those whom I love, <clears throat> teaching us to value every small thing in life, a true symbol of integrity, a gentle, reasonably gentle critic of my mistakes, but the first to appreciate every little job well done, and a fierce supporter of every just cause. I wish that we are together again in our next life, but with the roles reversed, so that I may care for you <clears throat> as selflessly as you have cared for me in this life. But in this life, as many people said, there is still so much to do. While COVID has got miseries galore, there is one hugely positive, unintended consequence, and that is the rapid transformation of the world into everything digital, the pivot to digital. The decade of the 20s will be remembered as the decade of digital. For all of us in the IT community, it is a decade in which we have the responsibility to help individuals and organizations make a rapid, painless, and beneficial transaction. 
This decade of digital is important, is a very important part of the 21st century, which I call the century of the mind, and therefore India's century. Now, coming back to Earth, and as I end, I want, do want to express my mood of the moment, and I'll use the mother tongue language option to, to say a few. <clears throat> I'll say a few words in a little poem I've created. Kabhi lagta tha suraj, ab dhalne laga, khub bulandi ke baad, vakt sambhalne laga. Aisa lagta tha, itna kush karne ke baad, vakt aya hai, aram palne laga. Tabhi vakt ne adbud sa mod jo liya, do chunotiyan mere saamne, आ गई एक भयानक कोविड का ऐलान आ गया और डेटा क्वेस्ट से रिटायरमेंट का फरमान आ गया दिस इज द डेटा क्वेस्ट अचीवमेंट अवार्ड सो एक भयानक कोविड का ऐलान आ गया और डेटा क्वेस्ट से रिटायरमेंट का फरमान आ गया गहरी सोच से अचानक जब आंख फिर खुली तो अंदर से एक आवाज ने कहा उठो दोस्त पिक्चर अभी बाकी है दिस सेम थॉट इज कैप्चर्ड ब्यूटीफुली इन हिज लाइंस बाय पोएट हफीज जलंधरी मेड फेमस बाय द लेजेंडरी सिंगर मलिका पुखराज इन द 1950s एंड आई विल रिसाइट अ फ्यू लाइंस हवा भी खुश गवार है गिलों पे भी निखार है तरन्नु में हजार है बाहर पुर बाहर है कहा चला है साकिया इधर तो लौट इधर तो आ अभी तो मैं जवान हूँ 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 सो विद दैट डेट रिक्वेस्ट थैंक यू फॉर इस वेरी स्पेशल मोमेंट एंड अ वेरी बिग थैंक यू टू ईच एंड एवरी वन ऑफ यू हु ज्वाइन दस टुडे Sir, you are on mute. PG, you have to unmute. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I was saying that was uh, good to hear the poet in you and the singer in uh, you. Um, you know, hidden talents. Uh, but it was really wonderful. And bilkul abhi to jawan hai. Industry bhi jawan hai. Or you know, many many more uh, miles to go. Uh, that's something which is definitely there. So look forward to many such uh, occasions. Uh, i'm sorry we are doing a virtual uh, trophy uh, you know because uh, uh, we do not have a physical award but what we will ensure is that this uh, uh, once you know the entire thing opens then we will have the trophy delivered to you so once again uh, with that uh, thank you very much for uh, everybody including the audience uh, it's it's been really a wonderful uh, 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 to to have you there uh, raji to to talk about a few things and uh, over to you ibrahim uh, congratulations once again mr pawar and really um, happy and proud that we were able to uh, recognize and uh, bring to the world once again the great work and contribution that you have done thank you so much i would and congratulations i would also like to especially thank <coughs> mr arjun malhotra and mr uh, gurnani for being here with us uh, to talk about uh, the past and the future of the indian it industry and i would also like to especially thank all the people who joined us online to listen to the great stalwarts and the makers of the indian it industry as i said we have on the digital world we have split this award into three parts 
So we will shortly be uh, reconvening where we will present the Data Quest IT Person of the Year and the Pathbreaker Award. Uh, thank you so much for the uh, hard work that the entire backend team put together. Thank you so much and uh, uh, congratulations once again and goodbye to all of you from Cyber Media thank and Data Quest. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.